Bill Hussey, I'm Dean here at Widener Law Commonwealth. It is my pleasure to welcome you to our annual Veterans Day program and CLE. The law school and the university have a long tradition of serving veterans dating back to the time, uh, the university's time as the Pennsylvania Military College. At the law school, we have a veterans initiative to support our veteran law students, some of whom are here today. The initiative provides to each of them academic, career, and financial support tailored to that veteran's unique needs and experience so that each may become a successful attorney. I'm delighted that you are here. I hope you enjoy today's program in CLE. I now hand it over to Professor, Professor Christian Johnson. It is really exciting to see everyone here. This is our seventh annual program that we've done here at the law school. And it's been great to see the support of the community and all the things that we've done. We even had two virtual programs uh, during the pandemic, which, which I was looking at uh, Molly Ackery. It, it, uh, they could have been better, but it, it, was, uh, it was still good to be able to celebrate even during the pandemic when all of these things were, uh, were going on. We'd like to welcome Senator Wayne Landerholk, who's, uh, who's going to join us for our panel today. He's a state senator from Cambria County. Um, we'd like to really thank our, the, uh, our uh, staff and personnel here at Widener Law School. Uh, Dean Hussey, of course, for his support, Molly Ackery, uh, Paula Heider, Bob Dolben, for all of the, the work that they do in making this possible. And in particular, I'd like to thank uh, Colonel Bob D'Souza, who's going to be our Master of Ceremonies this morning as we, uh, we have our uh, Veterans Program Ceremony, uh, after which we'll have our, um, the CLE portion. So, Colonel D'Souza. Thank you, Dean Hussey, former Dean Johnson. Uh, as I said, I'm Bob D'Souza. Uh, I'm of counsel at Eckerd Siemens and uh, retired colonel in the Pennsylvania Army National Guard. Uh, before we uh, start the program and, and uh, advance the colors, I do want to uh, just mention the two organizations that are uh, outside. Uh, the uh, first is uh, the, the Pennsylvania Army National Guard recruiters. Uh, I say that for, uh, for two reasons. Uh, many of you here are already uh, veterans, and many of you are also my age or north, so this isn't for you, but this would be for your kids and your grandkids, et cetera. Um, I think uh, it's, it's really important to, to uh, realize the huge benefits uh, in Pennsylvania, especially uh, within the National Guard, uh, which is not only that uh, the Army or the Air Guard is are one of the few institutions that will teach someone a marketable skill. They'll pay you to learn a marketable skill. But uh, the Pennsylvania General Assembly, of which Senator Langhoek is, is one, has made the Pennsylvania Guard one of the most competitive guards in the nation because of the packages that the General Assembly has put together in addition to the things you've all heard about, uh, you know, like the GI Bill. So in Pennsylvania, if you join the Guard, you get up to whatever the state system charges for tuition. You will get that to go to any school of your choice. That's number one. And here's the, the kicker that these guys uh, put in uh, just a couple years ago. Now, after you've done your initial tour, if you re-up, you will get that benefit for your spouse or your children. That's like a sixty, seventy thousand uh, dollar tax-free package. Uh, just a tremendous, uh, uh, tremendous offering. And in the old days, that education uh, uh, benefit was really more for enlisted personnel who many did not have a college degree. Now it applies to officers as well. So the officers can get that, get that for the kid, et cetera. So um, I know I myself, I went in, I did 28 years, but I went in when I was 33 years old, had not done a push-up or sit-up since high school, did not, uh, you know, all the rest of it, and uh, had a great, uh, great tour with it. Uh, so I, I do, uh, you know, even if you're uh, yourself over the age or whatever, uh, you know, pick up some information for a kid, a grandkid, someone you know. It's a, a wonderful, wonderful organization. It is truly uh, the biggest uh, fraternity uh, in the world uh, to belong to the uh, armed services of the United States. The second is the Veterans Outreach Program. I think some of you may have seen some of this uh, in the news. This is an absolutely tremendous, far-thinking uh, program. What it is developing is a set of mini homes 
for homeless veterans with a community center in, in the beginning where it will bring in all of the services from the VA, from the state, et cetera, to get these folks who have served their country from being homeless to having a job and having a home of their own and out of the program. But it's a wonderful, wonderful program. Please make sure you take some information, get some, uh, a stop there. I'm really happy that um, that uh, these folks uh, uh, have, uh, have come today, notwithstanding the fact that their executive director, though a friend of mine, is a Marine. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to have the uh, Cedar Cliff um, Junior ROTC program uh, present the colors. So at this point, if you're able, I'd ask you to please stand. And I would remind those of you who are veterans that by act of Congress, you are authorized. In addition, uh, you may either give the over the heart salute, but you are authorized by act of Congress to give the hand salute. Color guard, advance. This time I would ask Tara Mead to come forward to lead us in the national anthem. <clears throat> oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight, or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming, and the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave? Please join with me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Color Guard, retire the colors. You may be seated. Now I'm going to turn it back over uh, uh, to uh, uh, former Dean Johnson, who will uh, introduce our uh, uh, keynote speaker. Dean Johnson. Uh, please join me in thanking our Masters of Ceremony, Bob Sousa. This, this program really wouldn't be possible without uh, Colonel D'Souza. He's been a huge help to the law school ever since we started doing these programs. We appreciate all of the support and help that he's done. Um, it, it's my honor today to introduce our keynote speaker, the Honorable Patrick Murphy, a U.S. Congressman from 2007 through 2011, U.S. Secretary of the Army, U.S. Undersecretary of the Army, and probably most important, an alum of Widener Law School. So we're thrilled to have him come and speak. Uh, after, um, 
Patrick's remarks, I'll, I'll introduce our panel and we'll, uh, we'll move to that point. Christian, thank you so much. We appreciate it. Uh, appreciate your friendship. What, if you don't know Christian Johnson, the former dean here at Weiner, now professor, uh, has two children that are in the military and active service. So, Christian, thank you for, for being a, such a great leader to your family and to the school. Uh, dean Hussey, thanks so much for, for always having us. Uh, my former dean, Dean uh, Anfruth, good to see you, Dean. Uh, I know it's been uh, a minute since I've seen you, and, um, and thanks for always being here for our, for our students and for the faculty. Um, Bob Sousa, um, the colonel, I just want you to know, I took a red eye. Uh, I was at a conference yesterday speaking and got in at 5.30 this morning from in the Philadelphia airport. Uh, I did do PT at, at a Crunch Fitness and Union Deposit Road uh, and showered and shaved because I knew if I didn't shave, the colonel would make me do push-ups. So um, and he's been a great friend. Um, I'd like to, if it's okay, tell a very, very quick story about, about him. When I was up for Senate confirmation uh, to become the 32nd Undersecretary of the Army, which is the COO of the Army, um, there was two other uh, undersecretaries, the Secretary, Undersecretary of the Navy and the Air Force. They were also up. Uh, and he was working at the, for the time for Senator Pat Toomey. Uh, and he was, Senator Toomey was gonna introduce me in front of Senator John McCain, who was the chairman of the Senate Armed Services Committee. Uh, the other two undersecretaries didn't have a, their senator uh, introduced him, so we didn't have that scrub it. But Bob, you were there for me at a defining moment, and I, I won't forget that. And throughout my career, always helping our brother and sister veterans in our nation. So thank you. Uh, Tara Mead did a phenomenal job at the at singing the national anthem, and the, the cadets at at, um, at Cedar Cedar Cliff High School. The, JROTC program. Uh, if you don't know about the JROTC program, they're Army JROTC, so Junior Reserve Officers Training Corps. That is an incredible uh, recruitment tool for our military. Um, the average JROTC student will likely go to college um, or more likely to go into the military to earn an ROTC scholarship. Uh, but it's a phenomenal program that I think, frankly, should be expanded. Uh, so it's just, it just great. And then I know the panelists. So um, it's a personal, I know the Colonel's gonna, or Christian's gonna introduce the panelists, but uh, I love the fact that um, we have Lisa Grace, Grayson, who uh, was a retired Lieutenant Colonel, an elected official in Cumberland County, Register of Wills. Um, we obviously, we have uh, Army Colonel Ken uh, Tuzi. So we're trying to be bipartisan here. So we have Air Force and Army. Um, and then uh, my classmate and someone who I was here as a student full time, uh, but I knew I was going back into the army on active duty, but who worked out with me and used to talk about public service, including political public service, uh, state center and chairman of the transportation committee and on veterans affairs and uh, state center, Wayne Nairholt. So Wayne, thank you for being here uh, and being my friend. Uh, it means a lot. Uh, I'm gonna be quick because we have phenomenal panelists, but let me just, just say, Christian mentioned it, but Widener University, uh, I was a student here, I served on a board here for five years, I just turned off the board, but uh, Widener University School of Law used to, I'm sorry, Widener University as a whole, used to be Pennsylvania Military College several decades ago. Uh, it was the West Point of Pennsylvania, uh, and we are very blessed that we have uh, a great university and we have two campuses for two different law schools, one in Delaware, here at the Widener University Commonwealth School of Law. Um, but we have really done a phenomenal job uh, in being a leader in this Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and the region. Uh, we're the only one of, that I know of in Pennsylvania that actually has a veterans law clinic. Um, it, it's based out of our uh, Delaware campus, but because we have the Harrisburg Civil Law Clinic here, uh, we help out a lot uh, with veterans, and it's incredibly important. And it's important because in Pennsylvania, when you look at Pennsylvania as a demographic, there's 12 million folks in Pennsylvania, but we have 900,000 veterans uh, in Pennsylvania. We also have the second largest National Guard. Um, and what a lot of folks don't realize is that 
you know, when I was helping lead the army, there's a million soldiers, 300,000 civilians, but of those million soldiers, the majority were in a reserve component, like these two great National Guard officers here uh, were either National Guard or the Army Reserves. Uh, and so we are all one team, and it's incredibly important um, that, that we lead that way because if it's the governor of Pennsylvania calling 911, it's, he's calling the National Guard or the President of the United States when he needs it's It's our military. Uh, and I love the fact that we have one Marine uh, that stood up. And, sir, I feel like you're probably at home, even though you're the only one standing up, because Marines like to be outnumbered. Uh, yeah, <laughs> so that, that's right. So you see very, very comfortable. comfortable. Um, so it's an honor to be here in the 7th Annual uh, Veterans Symposium in the CLE, uh, and it's a, it's a special day. Let me just give you an overview of why I think it's important when we talk about some of the national security issues that we should be taking that the students that are here or us professionals in the legal profession should be thinking about. And that is the new, the fifth domain. The fifth domain, if you think of domains of warfare, land, air, sea, space. But the fifth domain, which is also known as the gray space, is cyber. And cyber and cybersecurity is critically important. Um, our adversaries um, have, you know, when they attack, whether it's our Pentagon by trying to penetrate uh, or our private sector, our local companies or corporations to steal their intellectual property, uh, it is getting worse, not better. Uh, and when you look at some of the things that we have done, I've been blessed. I've been serving on what's called the U.S. Cyberspace Solarium Commission for the last several years. There's 14 commissioners. I'm one of them. And it is a bipartisan, bicameral, public-private committee commission. And it's based on the, it's called a solarium because it's based after Eisenhower Solarium during World War II. Uh, but it's chaired by Sen Senator Angus King from the state of Maine and Congressman Mike Gallagher from the state of Wisconsin. But on this, of the 14 commissioners, it's members of Congress, it's CEOs, it's the Deputy Secretary of Defense, the FBI Director, et cetera. Uh, and we had 82 recommendations. So it wasn't one of these commissions where you have it and yet have it basically produce a treatise and it sits on a shelf somewhere. We had 82 recommendations, more than half of it became law. So one of the things that we recommended is to have a national cyber director, which we have. Other things, and what you're seeing is you're seeing a lot of things come down the pike to make sure that we protect citizens, their privacy and data privacy, because when there's a material breach of a company and their customers or their employees' information gets out there, their PII, uh, and it gets out in the dark web or out there, they're more likely to be a victim of identity theft. They're more likely to lose something very valuable to them. Um, and so it's hard to kind of see it when you're going through it, but historically I, it's a very fair comparison to Sarbanes-Oxley. So Sarbanes-Oxley is, remember, Enron uh, back in 1999, and we passed Sarbanes-Oxley in 2000. What did that do? That said, hey, you can't, as a C-suite executive, as a CEO, as a board of directors, you cannot outsource accounting principles just to the CFO. You can't just, well, it's the CFO's job or the accountants, I'm just giving you the numbers. They have a, a duty now to make sure those numbers are accurate. We now have audit committees on boards of directors. And so what you're seeing now because of the Cyberspace Solarium Commission and what's needed, you're seeing boards of directors now have human capital committees. And in those human capital committees you're seeing a very uh, that one of the directors needs to have experience in cybersecurity because when there's a material breach that happens, uh, too many companies and corporations would sit on their hands and not let their employees or their customers know until weeks, months, sometimes years after the fact. And so what you're seeing is what's really a new Sarbanes Oxley coming down the pike. Um, Legislation, um, I'm not overly hopeful for it. That's what we were hoping for. It's the best way to do it, so you can have hearings on it. 
But what you're seeing is some regulatory, uh, the SEC chairman, Gensler, is coming forward and saying, mandating that if there's a material breach that has to be reported to the federal government so we can, and again, when you look at the federal government and the SEC specifically making sure that these boards and these C-suite executives are doing the right thing, uh, not just for the companies or corporation, but also uh, for their customers and for the American people. So um, to put it in a framework, you know, when I was a student here in the late 1990s, um, America at that time was still that global superpower when it comes to re regulatory power. Uh, we were very progressive, some would say, at the time. Um, now we're no longer the regulatory superpower of the world. Now it is the EU and their 300 million based of customers. Uh, I'm sorry, 400 million based of customers and their governments. They're much more progressive when it comes to cybersecurity and putting out their uh, regulations, which you kind of see in other states like California and else, elsewhere that have been a little bit more aggressive on it. So I just want to kind of, I know it's kind of new and it's kind of somewhat murky to a lot of folks, but there is no doubt um, that cybersecurity is incredibly important and will be even more important in the years to come. Let me also just be very clear. It's not just losing data. It is life and death. We've had people die from cybersecurity attacks. Uh, hospitals have been shut down. Uh, wastewater treatment plants have been breached. And what you're seeing is our adversaries using cybersecurity to hurt some of our infrastructure. Why would they go after our infrastructure? 85% of our critical infrastructure uh, is in the private sector. So, you know, when you have, you know, the Senator Niagara Holtz who's here, who's an incredibly important person in our state government because he's the chair of the transportation committee, when he sees what's coming down the pike, it's incredible, incredibly important to have a Widener Law grad that there that understands these issues, that is ready to act and, and speak with real authority. So I want to touch on, on that. And I also just want to touch on, I mentioned it earlier, but just the Harrisburg Civil Law Clinic and why that's important. Um, we've asked less than 1% of our country to serve the longest wars in American history the last 20 years in Iraq and Afghanistan. And while those wars may be over, we still have over 190,000 troops deployed to over 190 countries across the globe. Why that's important is that, you know, our veterans are great civic assets. They're more likely to be employed. They're more likely uh, to start a small business for that small business to be successful. They're more likely to vote in elections no matter what their political persuasion is. They're more likely to be little league coaches and pastors in their churches. So let me just make sure I frame that the appropriate way. But the other side of the coin is that our veterans far too often fall through the cracks and hurt themselves. Um, we have lost, since 9-11 of 2001, we have lost over 120,000 veterans by suicide. Um, and death by suicide, the majority of those deaths are, are by firearm. But I think a lot of folks will say, well, just can't the federal government or what's the VA doing? And the majority of those veterans that have taken their own life are actually not in the VA system. Um, so um, I'm an honorary, I'm the national chair of what's called Face to Fight. It's a $40 million um, initiative with USAA, Humana, uh, and the REACH Foundation to have really a whole of nation approach when it comes to mental health and getting rid of the stigma in mental health because you can make a difference in making sure that our brothers, sister veterans know there are resources out there and that we're there for them. But um, what I ask is whether you're a veteran or not, it's not for the 1% that have served these longest wars, it's for all of us as Americans to make sure that we live by that ethic that we leave no one behind. Um, and it's not as if you know, the federal government hasn't just been sitting on their hands. We just passed, or they just passed. I'm not in the federal government anymore, uh, except for this commission, but the PACT Act. So I'm, hopefully you've all heard about the PACT Act. The PACT Act is a $787 billion piece of legislation which dramatically increases health care, uh, world-class health care for our veterans, but also benefits as well. Um, so things such as, I was just talking to Professor Joel Family 
uh, who's a professor here. Her father's a veteran, um, Vietnam veteran, and because he served in Vietnam, he he it's and he's had some health issues that are unique to Vietnam veterans. It's now assumed uh, it is now a condition that because he has that medical condition that he can go and apply for benefits, uh, benefits that he's earned, uh, health care um, compensation. So uh, that's a that's a very positive thing. But getting the message out there and doing what we can around the PACT Act is incredibly important. Um, one of the things that you'll see is um, because the, our population of veterans is declining, there's about 7% of the American population of veterans. Um, when you look at that um, and the footprint, um, the average VA hospital uh, is about 59 years of age. They were built after World War II when our troops came home. Um, the average private hospital is 16 years of age. Um, so it's not about brick, brick and mortar our way to a solution, but our veterans have earned world-class health care. Uh, and so you're going to see these public-private partnerships with the government, building new hospitals, new clinics. Uh, we were just had a signing ceremony the other day. We're building a new one at Philadelphia uh, with the University of Pennsylvania, uh, a new VA hospital, a clinic in, in um, Coatesville, in Chester County. Uh, that's a mental health clinic and, and a healthcare clinic. Um, so you're seeing more things happen, uh, which is which is very very positive. So uh, I promised uh, Christian Johnson I wouldn't go because we have phenomenal speakers that I'm going to join them. But just want to say from the bottom of my heart, thank you all for being here on a Monday. Um, it, it's very much appreciated, and thanks for all that you do and continue to do. So God bless all of you. I've, I've never been able to get my students to bunch together like all of you have done. And so I'm going to, Patrick, I'm going to get us to move these tables, shift them over a little bit so we can, yeah, move them out diagonally a little bit so we can stage a little bit easier. You know, I, I thought that was just wonderful remarks. Thank you, Patrick, and for um, getting on a red eye and, and arriving like you, uh, you've had a, a restful weekend, which I know you haven't, and so it's terrific to, uh, to see you here. Um, one thing that struck me is, as I was listening to uh, Patrick's remarks, you know, he, he focuses on the cybersecurity issues that, uh, that we're facing, you know, I. I would guess when we go back to uh, the end of World War II, through the Cold War, that uh, there's there's some analogies to the to dealing with the nuclear problem that we had back then. My guess is that people thought that you know getting through these nuclear issues were probably as daunting as we're seeing now with uh, cybersecurity. Um, the uh, the tragedy of the loss of life through suicide and other problems that a lot of our veterans are suffering, the uh, infrastructure the VA is struggling with. And, um, you know, one, one thing as I was listening, I was thinking as um, lawyers, and we're often viewed as problem solvers and uh, dealing with these things, that it'd, be, uh, that it'd be nice to think about how as lawyers do we deal with these things. I'd like to take just a minute to, uh, to introduce our panel and to... Uh, Get the remarks. Of course, we've uh, we've heard from uh, Colonel D'Souza. We have Colonel Ken Tazi, who's uh, was a, a uh, and 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 pardon me, Colonel Tazi, you were a a judge, but I forget your title. Terrific. We have uh, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Lisa Gray Grayson, who's at the Cumberland County Register of Wills and Clerk of Orphans Court, and very active here in uh, in Pennsylvania. And then we have uh, Wayne Landerholk, who is an alum, class of 2000, state senator from Cambria County, and serves on the Veterans Affairs Committee. And we're uh, we're grateful to have uh, all of them here and to have a discussion. We'll probably finish in. Uh, 
half hour to 40 minutes on that. And so, uh, Bob, I'd like you to take just a few minutes, uh, this, uh, Colonel Asusa, to, to start us off and to kind of reflect on some of your thoughts about um, uh, Patrick's remarks. Well, I think that uh, out of the box um, uh, kind of goes a little to what I said in introducing the, the JAG recruiters uh, is that um, so we're all move your mic a little closer up. We're all lawyers uh, in this room, and and many are are veterans, and uh, we learn a certain way to think and and act as lawyers, but we also learn a certain way of thinking and analyzing things uh, when we're in uniform. And so when, when Patrick's presenting these, it's because we have to look at things in a cold, uh, real way. We can't simply say, you know, hey, America is the best, the best, the biggest, whatever. We have to look at where our, our, our fault lines are. And um, I, I do think when we have that marriage of, of being trained to think as a lawyer, uh, we have that ability to serve in uniform and see uh, how, you know, the military itself analyzes uh, problems. Um, it, it helps bring to light uh, where those soft uh, spots and, and issues are. And, you know, we, we think of a cyber attack, for example, as being um, as being very sophisticated to hit something or whatever. But, but think of this. Patrick mentioned <laughs> that uh, the Army, which is the biggest component, is approximately a million, a million one, right? But 60-some percent of them are guardsmen and reservists. Okay, so, uh, you know, when, when, when I was a young man, we had almost the same amount that we have in the regular army in Germany. Okay, so that gives it, you know, just the scale. But um, what if there is a something and there's a general mobilization, right? And all of a sudden, my cell phone goes off and says, uh, return home, uh, uh, misinformation, uh, there is no, that's a cyber attack. You know, I get this. I think, all right. Well, they know. You know, this, you know, this, this is, uh, you know, this is a uh, U.S. Army command. Return home. You know, or, uh, or um, we say, that, you know, we're mobilizing people. Where are they mobilizing? Turn off the, uh, turn off the, the, the uh, stop. You know, the traffic lights in Norfolk. Just turn them off. Right? They can't get there. Everything jams up. Right? So we have to be thinking through how. How uh, do we solve these things when, as Patrick points out, 80% of that infrastructure is in uh, private hands? So I do think uh, it, 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 some of these issues become brighter, uh, clearer, uh, as we have to face them when you have those two, two types of training. Uh, Ozzy, do you have uh, thoughts also on this? Um, a couple of things I wanted to point out, uh, just in terms of military law. I was in the JAG Corps for 30 years, the Army JAG Corps active, and uh, Colonel D'Souza already said it, but we're, we're all lawyers and we're real lawyers. So we were subject to the same rules that you all are. I w I've been licensed in Pennsylvania since 1987. Um, I I've, I've been subject to the uh, disciplinary rules just like everybody else. And that's something that I think is important to point out uh, when you think about military lawyers out there, um, a lot of people don't realize, realize that they are, they're lawyers, uh, they're, we're licensed in all different states, obviously, but we, we come back to our state, our home states, uh, for uh, advice and really for our um, regulatory requirements. So we are all lawyers, and we all have clients. That's another thing that you may not think about uh, before I became a judge, I, was, I did a lot of environmental law. I did years of that for the Army. Um, and I represented the Army. I did not represent particular commanders. Uh, that's something that, that is important to think about. A lot of times our client is the service or the, the organization, not a particular commander. And it was difficult at times to... Um, to sit in a meeting, and you've all probably been there with your clients, and in the Army and in the service, I think it may even be worse, because everybody's in the execute mode. The commander says, I want to do X. Well, everybody else's job is really to make sure that X happens. The logistics people, the personnel people, 
all the, all the staff, they're there to support the commander. And a lot of times, the only person in the room who says, wait a minute, we need to think about this, is the JAG, is the lawyer. So we really do a job uh, as an honest broker and also in, in ensuring that the law is complied with by our client. And it's not that commander. It's the United States, and it's really, in my case, it was the Army. So I would have to tell my commander once in a while, look, I'm not representing you. I'm representing the Army, and you're going down a path that is not legal. There may be a way we can get to your goal if you give me some time. We can figure out how to do this legally. And, of course, the other staffs or staff members are looking at you like, well, you're just an obstructionist. No, I want to make sure you all don't get into trouble. So probably similar to you, we have a lot of those same uh, issues that we deal with. And the last thing I'd just throw out to you uh, preliminarily is that when uh, there's a lot of things in the news now that you're seeing about war crimes and uh, with, with the conflict that's going on, it's, it's in the news, it, it's front and center. Uh, we do hold our people accountable when they do uh, misdeeds, when they violate the laws of war. Uh, in my classes, uh, some of my students, ex-students are here, uh, we talk about um, my lai. We, we talk about that from Vietnam, uh, and it's important. We talk about Abu Ghraib, which was a very difficult thing for our country, uh, and as an appellate judge, I dealt with several of those cases. So he, even here at Widener, we try to, to impart the idea that people are accountable for what they do, and there are, are laws of war that uh, that we're all subject to when we when we put on the uniform, so uh, we try to focus on that in class uh, as much as we can when we have time for that. So uh, those are kind of my initial thoughts. Yeah. Back, Colonel Grayson, um, and I'd be curious from your your position at the in Cumberland County if you see the role of the law or see effect on veterans or anything that goes on that way also as well. So. All right. So to um, follow up on what Ken said, when you're the only one in the room who's disagreeing with a commander, on active duty, you're usually not that person in the room when you're a young JAG. You work your way up in the guard, in the reserve. Many times there's only one or two JAGs in the entire uh, outfit, whether it's a battalion or a wing or whatever, and so you could be very low on the totem pole and be telling someone five ranks above you, sorry, sir or ma'am, we can't do that. Talk about intimidating. You're used to sitting in your office talking to your client. You probably aren't very intimidated by your client, but when you're in the military, very often you are intimidated by that commander that you're serving. I had uh, some service where I actually did operational law, which is even different than serving in a regular wing or battalion. Uh, in that situation, we actually followed uh, the laws of war. In particular, we were doing homeland defense, and when an attack or a perceived attack was coming into the U.S., there were certain items you had to look for as a JAG, and I had a checklist, and, and if they showed hostility, uh, refused to follow orders, like if, if uh, planes were coming in particular, because I'm Air Force, that, that's what our focus was on. But the commander was always, I was right behind the commander. He had all his advisors there, and I was right there, and it was like, JAG, do we have all of, all of the things necessary for us to now attack? And that, that's a lot to be putting on a young officer so you see a lot of very senior officers up here, but when you're a young officer, it's intimidating, so you really do need to know the laws, not only from your state, but from the federal level and what we can do in war. On the county level, I don't interact a lot with the, with the veterans because we have a veteran office in our county. What I do see is certain offices provide benefits to uh, veterans. For example, if you need a copy of your divorce or your marriage records or and other documents that the government produces you get those free it's a small benefit but we have veterans come in all the time that we give those so that's really the only thing that i i interact with the veterans in my current position perfect 
And uh, Senator Lanterholk, it's nice to have you here and to provide a, a view as a legislator for us, help us understand what uh, your thoughts on these issues. Yes, and, and first let me thank you for the invitation. It's an honor to be up here with this panel. Uh, it, just building upon what Patrick spoke about, the fifth domain there, the cybersecurity. So I can remember and thinking back as I came in here this morning and took a left on Progress Avenue, how much it's changed since I was here, which well, I just realized was about 23 years ago, which is crazy to me. But uh, even in the late 90s, think of the technology that we had then. I think I had a cell phone with like 10 peak minutes at the time. <laughs> and now, you know, look at that. It's what's happened. And, and what I always say you know, in the General Assembly, in the legislature, legislature it's about never be, being complacent, always trying to stay ahead, and never just, you know, always trying to adapt to what's out there, what's next. And it's a balancing act of what we have to do in the legislature to make sure that our National Guard is fully funded, that they have the resources and the opportunities they need to be able to effectively do their job. And with that, this emerging technology, and I can speak just from the Transportation <coughs> Committee, being the chair of the Transportation Committee and seeing the technology that's emerging. When you talk about cyber threats on a phone or your institution is a very real threat as well. But then what's happening in airspace now with drones and the <coughs> increase in manufacturing and what that can do to present up, you know, possible vulnerabilities within our infrastructure and even more than that, autonomous vehicles that are being tested out in, in Pittsburgh. That is, uh, you know, Carnegie Mellon being a worldwide leader in that and what challenges that presents you don't even think about you know you have some you have a vehicle driving down the road or a tractor trailer driving down the highway with nobody behind it and that's the real possible that's what's going to be happening that's what we're dealing with and trying to, to grapple how do you address that just from a liability perspective how do you address that as far as cyber security if someone god forbid takes a hold of that you know through cyber attack and then has a, a weapon which is a, a 18 wheeler driving down the road, those are the things that we're constantly trying to deal with to make sure that they're, they're adequately addressed, and it's a constant balancing act. That's terrific. Yeah, Pat, uh, Bob? Oh, yeah. Christian, uh, 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 you know, the senator was talking uh, some about, you know, this futuristic stuff, and Patrick uh, touched on that as well, but when you're talking about the, the moral fortitude and the ethics part, I want to go back to something that Lisa said uh, uh, for two reasons. One. To, to paint that scenario of, of the junior officer and two, to show how entities like the Department of Defense and the Army do ultimately change with time. So when I was a, a, a young lieutenant, that was the structure. I mean, you, 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 you'd be a lieutenant or captain, and there is a major general, and he, he wants to do something, and he wants to do it yesterday, okay? And... Uh, the structure was such that there were fewer judge advocates, and they the, the mindset was sort of judge advocates, chaplains, and other unnecessary personnel. That's really how they looked at things. Well, um, the after 9/11, after ramp up, when when you're talking about the, the two folks you see in uniform uh, over there now. Uh, the judge advocate component of a headquarters law is much expanded, much expanded. And commanders themselves now have as a mindset, I don't want to go to jail, or I don't want to be hailed before a legislative committee. Okay, so uh, it, 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 the, the, the big army, big DOD has changed in recognizing the role. But um, you know, when you look at both of those situations, I think it helps us when we come over to, to private practice in that uh, you, 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 if you serve a time in uniform, you not only have those state rules that, that Ken told you, you belong to a state bar, but you've got army rules. You've got eth general governmental ethical rules, and they stay in, in your background. And, you know, that, that point that Lisa touched on, you know, from, from day one you learn as a judge advocate, you have the moral and ethical obligation to tell that commander, no, you cannot do that. And, and that's, a, that's something as, as, you know, we talk about, you know, from, from uniform to the boardroom, that's an important component. You, you have to be able to tell the client or whatever when, when, when it's, you know, gray area leaning into not so gray area that no, the answer is no. Just if I could just... Yeah, please. We all see it, but 
It's when you're a lawyer, even at a company, you're not representing the CEO, you're representing the company. And so that's why it's an interesting dynamic. And for those who aren't veterans or, or haven't practiced military law, uh, Judge uh, Tuzzi said this, uh, the Colonel said how we follow the military rules of evidence, which are the same as the federal rules of evidence. It's so um, you actually get more criminal law rights in the military than in the civilian sector. So I, when I left here, I was a military and a federal prosecutor and, and joined the faculty at West Point, so I taught constitutional law for, for three years. Um, but when you think about the Fifth, Fifth Amendment right, right, Miranda warnings, right, when do you get Miranda warnings, when do they attach? When you're in custody, right? So if a cop's walking down the street, he suspects you something, he asks you, he does nothing to read your Miranda warnings unless he stops you and puts you in custody. In the military, a military police officer has to give you your Article 31B rights, which is basically your Miranda warnings, if they suspect you. And if you say something, then it'll come, it'll come out, or it can't come out in court. So you get more Fifth Amendment rights against self-incrimination. You get more Sixth Amendment rights to counsel uh, because you automatically get a lawyer uh, attached to you. And our lawyers, defense counsel specifically, um, are someone who's already been an experienced judge advocate. So it's not someone fresh out of law school, uh, which is a positive thing. I will say, to be fair and balanced here, you do get less First Amendment rights, freedom of expression and speech in the military. Uh, and religion, but I think you all can understand why, uh, as long as it relates to good order and discipline, the Supreme Court has, has deferred to military judgment on, on those type of things. Terrific, terrific. You know, yeah, go ahead, please. Just following up, oh, just to hit that point home, in the civilian sector, you're typically either in the prosecution or defense if you do criminal law. Very rarely do you change, unless you were a former ADA and then went out to private practice then usually changed to defense. In the military, you cut your teeth on being a prosecutor or government's counsel. And if you're really good at that, then the military sends you over to the defense counsel. So our defense counsel typically are highly functioning uh, judge advocates and they don't report to that commander. They are completely outside of that realm to prevent undue influence from the commanders on defense counsel. The defense counsel system funnels through just the defense counsel, so they do have a hierarchy that they uh, are responsible to, but they don't answer to that commander, uh, which helps prevent any undue influence, which is another benefit that we get. They don't answer to that commander now. Correct. Okay. When, when, and that's important when, when, when we look at the things Patrick talked about, you know, all the things going on, and we look at uh, war crimes and this kind of thing, that, that Department of Defense and the Army, the, the Air Force, they do change. They do try to improve because, you know, when I was a young judge advocate, you were prosecuting this month and defending next month. And your chain of command was up to that commander who was, did not say, boy, you got him off, you know, great job. It was, it was, I wanted that guy punished. And he's like, sir, my job was to defend him. So. They have changed that now. In the Guard, is, they first changed it in the active component, but it took a while for the Guard and Reserve. Now, if you're in the trial defense service, you answer up to another lawyer who is in the defense service up to another lawyer who is in the defense service so that you're, you know, you're awarded for doing a good job, not uh, you know, yelled at by the commander. Right. And historically, that has not been the case. If you, if you look at why we have a uniform code of military justice, it really goes back to World War II when it was just the opposite. They would have court martials. They didn't have non-judicial punishment back in those days. So if you got in trouble as a soldier or a sailor, you went to a court martial. And the people that were the prosecutors were the, were the smarter, more advanced officers in truth. And if you were a defense counsel during World War II and you did a good job and got a Marine off of a charge, they would turn around and tell you, guess what? You're not a defense counsel anymore. You're now a prosecutor. So all these soldiers and sailors and Marines came back from World War II, and they didn't like that. And that was one of the reasons that we got the UCMJ in 1950, which include things like Article 31B, which expand. We, we were really, when you think about it, Miranda was 66. The UCMJ really goes back to 1951. So. 15 years prior to Miranda, there were rights warnings um, in the military. So 
history plays a part in this, and we've come a long way since the days of, of uh, World War II. And I also wanted to point out, too, that the judges are in the same uh, boat. Uh, as a military judge, you are in what we call a stovepipe. Nobody can touch you. When I became a military judge, it was strange because my phone never rang. When I, was at, when I was at command council, my phone rang 24-7. I was getting woke, awakened at night. As a military judge, you just sit there, and you had to wait for the cases to come to you, and that was good reason. Nobody could try to influence you into how you ruled on some fairly high-profile cases. So uh, from the ethics standpoint, I think you'd see the same thing with the uh, the military judiciary as you see in the civilian judiciary. And we have a wheel just like you have in the clerk's case, uh, clerk of court's offices so that, you know, my panel uh, did not get all the important cases or the ones where they wanted the government to win. I was one of three panels and it was just a rotational thing. What cases I got was really random, uh, similarly to what I think you probably find in your uh, county uh, judicial offices as well. I'll just add to what, uh, what Ken, met, Ken mentioned, Article 15, those of you who have served understand that that's the commander's informal, but what that is is a commander's informal way of resolving uh, something, and uh, a, a scenario that you'll understand from his point regarding the World War II component, if you'll remember in a, a, a Band of Brothers, where uh, they're going to uh, discipline Winters. He wants to discipline Winters for a BS charge. And Winters says, I demand court-martial, because that was the only option. There is no way to do that, but you, know, you could waive court-martial, and that's what he expected, because that's what most people did. They would waive court-martial to get the informal, but Winters demands court-martial because he knows he's going to win at court-martial because the charges are, are BS. I'd like to pull us back just a minute. Cyber uh, issues, you know, I, I, I kind of bridge the gap between no technology to total technology. Now, I remember the, the first IBM PCs came out in 80 to 82, uh, the age of the fax machine, 1990 through 94, especially if you were in business, that's the way you communicated. I was just reflecting, I got my first email account in 1995, um, and then we, we started to see the web browsers uh, come about then. I don't remember when I got my first cell phone. I guess it just seems to have become a part of me and uh, don't remember that. And, um, and this is all foreign, though, to most of my students. They've, they've grown up, and, and, and most, I think, of our younger military, they, they grew up having a cell phone from elementary school or junior high and have always been connected. And, and so I have a question for Patrick and, and get, maybe get some reflection from the panel. How do you see... Um, the people you're working with that are my generation now, how well are they adapting to just a completely different world where they they didn't grow up in when they were when they were first starting to serve and everything? So, well, a couple of things. One, as Christian said, everyone has one of these. Uh, the footprint in the United States, we have a larger target environment in the United States because we are very connected. We're more connected in the United States than any other country in the world which makes us much more vulnerable, frankly, to, to attacks. Since COVID, specifically, cyber attacks have gone up 600% throughout the world. Um, and so our adversaries literally have battalions of folks uh, together in rooms trying to break into um, not just the Pentagon, but to the tri-sector specifically. The tri-sector is in cybersecurity is known as finance, telecommunications, um, and energy, uh, and they're trying to always breach these companies. Uh, if you ask J.P. Morgan, the CEO of J.P. Morgan, is J.P. Morgan a bank? I'll say no, it's a technology company. Their budget is uh, massive on cyber and cybersecurity. Um, when you look at the federal government as a whole, and America as well, we are about just under a million jobs short in cybersecurity. So in the federal government, uh, about 80,000 jobs short in cybersecurity professionals that we need, uh, and in the private sector, a little over 700,000 that were short. So uh, we, we provide, uh, I, I chair a presidential commission or presidential task force called Task Force Movement, which helps 
uh, young Americans, when you look at cybersecurity professionals, most of them, you don't need a four-year degree. You just need certifications, two years or certain certifications. And the average salary usually start in six figures. I mean, it's a, it's very, uh, and it's only going to grow. I mean, it's going to be about 13, 14% growth in that market for the next decade. Sir, Lander, how, how well do you feel our legislature is is up to this task of, of uh, helping Pennsylvania deal with these kinds of issues and uh, it's a it's a tremendous task and it's uh, I always say when I when people used to run for office at least maybe in, I'm from western Pennsylvania you, know, you say we're gonna bring jobs to this region we're gonna bring jobs jobs now it's like the total inverse of that we can't find people to fill those jobs and it's a constant battle with the companies not just in my district but statewide on workforce development and I think you see more investments in these past two budgets to address that and it's a big concern how do we find people to fill those jobs and just this week actually we're in session this week Monday Tuesday Wednesday but on Thursday I'm having back in my district at what's called an alternatives to college job fair so we have different individuals and different companies there that you know if you have a high school student that's that's looking for a career but maybe doesn't necessarily want to go to college they have a different alternative and you know like patrick said there's other pathways to addressing this need but i hear it all the time i mean i can't go anywhere in my district without you know can fill in the blanks we could hire blank more blank tomorrow you know in manufacturing not just cybersecurity but all all that which even manufacturing now is becoming more technical and it's not the old you know you think whenever you're you know we're growing up my parents you're gonna go to college you're gonna go to college and it's but it's not that type of factory job anymore there's more of that component with cyber you know with uh, technology that also then makes it vulnerable which goes back to how do we fill that need and how do we make sure that we are uh, finding people that can fill those jobs that can you know to, to address that issue yeah, uh, yeah right. but, it, he's, the center is absolutely right i mean it's really skills based now and so you see folks like governor shapiro and then you know and it was a bipartisan initiative where they opened up over twenty thousand jobs in the commonwealth of pennsylvania where you don't need a college degree now uh to expedite a workforce and to be more agile to bring people in and you've seen other states do that as well and, and i would add one on the, exactly on what, what they said and one sort of on the flip so uh, on the same spot it goes back to what I said about uh, our, our, our two representatives from, from recruiting offices here in that you know, you, if you've got a you know, young kid, grandkid or whatever that's 16, 17, they don't know what they want to do. The military is one of those darn few places that will train them in a marketable skill. And I know for my own son, uh, we well could have afforded him go straight into college. That wasn't uh, the issue, although it was great to have that benefit, let me tell you. But he didn't know what he wanted to do. He was a good kid. He didn't know what he wanted to do, and he went into the guard. They, they, he tested high on the test, and they said, we're, we're putting you in military intelligence. And they taught him the computer skills that he now uses. He's a college grad now, but that's what he uses in the job he has with the Vanguard group. But what I also work, when we talk about the ethical responsibility of, of, of lawyers and of others, I also worry about the flip side of the technology, which is um, those of us who learned how to read a book who, who actually shepherdized from a list, who actually look at, and those of us who are really ancient, who, you know, used the Dewey Decimal System, uh, the, I have a great fear for younger generations for when this goes out. The computer goes out, and the default is, well, you wait till the computer goes on. And I think that's a... I think that's a problem for for lawyers. I definitely think it's a problem in our military because I know, you know, that young kid who's trained us in artillery men. I know we, they do the exercise where it goes out, but that's sort of like the land nav exercise I had. And believe me, if I were lost in in the woods, my question would be, Sergeant, where are we, and how do we get out of here? Because I couldn't do that. I took the course. I can't do that. And I do worry about the the flip of the technology that we've become so dependent. On, on this stuff that we don't know what to do when it goes down. I would, I would add, though, I think the military does a better job in enforcing and teaching cyber issues. 
for years in the military, every year you had to recertify that you have done your, your cybersecurity. And working in a government unit, we just started doing that. And, and it's not nearly to the, the extent that the military does. And I also believe that the military, at least my experience, they, um, it doesn't matter what your rank is, you need to know how to use the computer systems and you're forced to do it, where I won't mention any names, but we still have a judge or two in our county <laughs> that won't even read their email. Their <laughs> law clerks print everything off for them, even though we can send the entire case to that judge in electronic format. We have some judges that just will not do it, where I, don't, I never saw that that was even an option in the military. It didn't matter what your rank was, you had to be uh, at least proficient in the electronic world. Yeah, Ken? Unfortunately, unfortunately, Lisa, there's members in, of Congress that don't have a cell phone um, that do the same thing. So uh, usually on the Senate side. So in fact, when we got in the House of Representatives, don't be offended when I say this, but they grabbed the Democrats and Republicans big, hey, you guys and gals might fight with each other, but the real enemy is the other, the upper branch, uh, the Senate. <laughs> so uh, not the state Senate. Um, but. Um, <laughs> Yeah, uh, it's interesting because I'm always thinking, you know, what we're saying here, we're not, we're not anti-college, we're not anti-law school, right? We're just putting the framework out there. But even in the senator's district in Johnstown, you know, we have St. Francis uh, University, which I, it, that's not in Johnstown, it's in Cabri County, right? It's, it's close enough. Close enough. Half hour, Loretta. Um, and, you know, they have a great program uh, with cybersecurity training on technical, um, very technical skills. And it's called Project Archangel because uh, uh, the patron saint of soldiers, uh, of troopers are, is St. Michael the Archangel. But what you see in cybersecurity and identity theft, because when you look at the Gallup polls, the most well-respected profession in America and, and frankly the world is the U.S. military or the military, um, they'll use military images of folks, create fake accounts and scam people out of their money. So, and when that happens, um, I know two cases where there was a pharmacist in, in, in Fort Lauderdale uh, that thought that she was given Patrick Murphy $250, $500 at a clip. She spent $60,000 thinking that she was helping me because I was in Syria and I was going through a divorce and all that. I had no idea about it, but when I found out about it, you know, I called my friend over at the FBI, et cetera. They can't touch it because $60,000 is nothing to the FBI. The Attorney General's office, it's, it's really this gray area that, unfortunately, there's perpetrators out there. And, and unfortunately, there was a case where there was four individuals in Nigeria who uh, made it sound like they were women or online. It was, they falsified that they were, a, it was a woman and they had a relationship online with a, 16 year old high school student uh, asked him to send pictures. They sent pictures of a younger girl, both inappropriate back and forth. Well, it was four guys, and then when they confronted him, they said, Hey, you need to give us $10,000 or we're going to send these pictures to all your classmates and to your parents, and you're going to be in big trouble. Um, he sent a few hundred dollars because that's all he had access to. Uh, they said, It's not enough. If you don't get this by midnight tonight, he took his own life. Uh, he was under all that stress. So then the FBI came in and arrested those four individuals. But uh, I say that because at St. Francis University, and you know, I don't know if we have a program at Widener or a specific faculty member or two that's involved in cyber, but you know, we should link them up with St. Francis University because they're doing this Project Arch Archangel now that that is really trying to be a buffer so people, when they do get scammed, they have a place to go to that will actually, they have these students that under faculty guidance will investigate and try and help and then turn it over to law enforcement uh, if need be, or, or at least help people get potentially their money back. It's really a phenomenal program which uh, really should be replicated throughout the country. Uh, Ken, did you have a... I, I was just going to just touch on the idea of technology and one thing I've, I've thought about a lot is that there's no substitute for our skills as lawyers. There's no computer that's going to tell you 
how, how, whether a legal standard has been met or not. Um, when I was on the court, we would get these cases where someone would say, that, that, is a, that is an inappropriate sentence. It's inappropriately severe. And I would have very young commissioners who would do all this research, and they would try to figure this out. And at the end of the day, I used to tell them, sometimes you need to step away from all that stuff. And you have to think about, what do I think about this? What are the facts? What are the facts that really are relevant? And how do I weigh them? And there's no computer that's going to tell you how to weigh facts or how to make a decision ultimately in a lot of the things that we do. So I used to try to encourage, particularly my younger counsel, every once in a while, get off of the, get away from your desk, get away from the computer, go for a walk and think about it with a clear head. What do you think is right? What's, where, where, where do we need to be in this particular case? How can we get there? Or in the case of the judges, you know, what do you think is an inappropriately severe sentence based upon the facts that we have? And you've got to look at the facts, analyze the facts. It's like we learned uh, in law school and like the students are still learning. So um, I, I really agree with uh, Colonel D'Souza in that when everything goes away, you still have to function as a lawyer. Um, I was the guy in 1988 who I was sitting in my office with this and a guy came in and threw a computer on my desk literally and said here's your computer Captain Tazi and I said well what am I supposed to do with that you know and uh, you know eventually we learned about email and all those things but um, you still have to have those basic skills that no, no in my opinion, no technology replaces. A thought to end on. Please uh, join me in thanking our panel. And, and please remember, for those of you wanting CLE, to make sure you complete all the, the paperwork that you need to do. So thank you very much. We will see you uh, next year. Thank you.